continue our discussion for the COVID-19 um, concepts. And the discussion is very, very interesting today. We will go over the math plus protocol. And I have actually started calling it a little math plus plus protocol because there are some modifications that I think we will make as well. So let us start our discussion. So before the discussion starts, I wanted to also um, discuss with everyone over here that we are, uh, I'm happy that Lancet and the New England G Journal of Medicine have retracted the studies that were published by Mera A. All for uh, uh, the, what was that? The hydroxychloroquine and the other one about the cardiovascular diseases and COVID-19 patients. So that is actually a good thing, a wise thing. I still feel bad that WHO did a knee-jerk re reaction and caused the, um, the hydroxychloroquine uh, studies to stop, the trials to stop, that caused a worldwide um, news cycle, which then led to so much rumor when I talk with someone about hydroxychloroquine, they simply send me that, uh, that study and say, here is a study that shows that it causes damage. Then you have to go back and show them that here is what WHO said, here is where the retraction is. And so there's a lot of damage done. Someone needs to be held accountable for that. But at this time, I want to make sure that we, one, see the retractions, and then we start discussing the math plus protocol. In the math plus protocol, as I look at it and I um, and I study it, there is a lot to unpack, especially the before the ICU and hospital, and then after the hospital or during the hospital and ICU. So I'm going to split our discussion into two parts as well, because for the second part, the ICU part, we have to kind of understand a little more of the pulmonary physiology and pathology and the management processes that take care that, that take place in the hospitals and ICUs. So I have to develop some concepts there with you. So we're going to divide it into two pieces. So I hope that is okay. So let's start. So uh, welcome everyone. We're talking about Math Plus. So let's start a discussion. I'm going to share my screen. And the first things that I would like to see is here. This is the Lancet, and this is their retraction. So hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine with or without macrolide for treatment of COVID-19, a multinational registry analysis, this has been retracted. I am so comfortable. So look, we still need more to understand that hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine or hydroxy plus azithromax plus zinc, how would they perform? We will continue to see that. But this is still important for us that any studies that may not have the right um, approach should be removed and the no other studies should continue till we have the right results in front of us. So I'm very happy. So Lancet's statement is, today three of the authors of the paper hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine with or without a macular treatment of COVID-19 a multinational registry analysis have retracted their study. They were unable to complete an independent audit of the data underpinning their analysis. As a result, they have concluded that they can no longer vouch for the veracity of the primary data source. The Lancet takes issue of scientific integrity extremely seriously, and there are many outstanding questions about such as fear and the data that were allegedly included in the study. I have actually a problem with Lanc Lancet itself as well, that why was Lancet not rigorous in looking at a study before publishing that had such expansive and sweeping uh, conclusions in it? Did that just slip by the Lancet editors as well? And I'm sure that they would have some way, some chain of uh, processes that looks at the study and decides it should be published as well. So Lancet cannot just simply put it on the original authors and simply say, we are, we, we, they just, just took it back. So Lancet has a responsibility in here as well. And within the original study authors, I feel that there is further digging to be done to figure out 
who was the one who caused this somebody has to be held accountable for this kind of a thing i'm actually upset about moderna as well i hope moderna's data is something that we can look at that moderna also did this that they created a new cycle they took advantage of it and i do not know where do they stand now so <clears throat> this is lancet here is the new england journal of medicine same um author mera had and he's a cardiologist he had published a study there cardiovascular disease drug therapy and mortality in covid-19 and this was also retracted so again look at the new england journal of medicine they are simply saying because all the authors were not granted access to the raw data and the raw data could not be made available to a third party auditor we are unable to validate the primary data source underlying our article cardiovascular disease we therefore request that the article be retracted we apologize to the editors and to the his idea these folks are saying that we ended up publishing a study and we do not see the data and somehow we still are not allowed to look at the data so please take the study back why were they not able to look at the did they never talk about it that hey where is the data whoever is processing the data for us uh, isn't is that the correct data or not i thought that it was the sergi sophia was a company owned founded and he is a ceo this uh, dr desai is a ceo of that company is that now a new thing that somehow the data is still not available so i am kind of this this uh, letter looks devious to me but anyways good news is that they have taken those back so with this let's start now to our discussion so we are going to go over this protocol so this is the math plus protocol this is by paul marek md and his colleagues and he is a chief of pul pulmonary and critical care medicine eastern virginia medical school norfolk this is may 25th so let's very quickly look at it i wanted to make sure that we understand the basic concepts here number 1 <clears throat> what i have done is i've added one more plus here that plus is going to come from r side that is the cool beans here that there are some things that i think when you look at it you would probably say that yeah this needs to be different and fortunate i was actually surprised today that the discussions that we have done we the cool beans here the discussions that we have been doing that volume of knowledge is so useful to understand these studies and even to be able to comment on them and say i think over here there needs to be a change so i am very um, i'm very happy i feel very blessed that we all got together and worked on those things together so there the um, uh, the study the math not study the protocol treatment protocol they have a core concept about the pathology of the sars cov So so far, I think we all have discussed this. That what happens is we say that for for SARS-CoV, there is probably an upper respiratory tract infection. Then it is a possibility that there is lower respiratory tract infection. Then we say that the atypical pneumonia occurs. Then pneumonia, typical pneumonia. Then acute respiratory distress syndrome. Then septic shock, and then unfortunately death. these are the steps that we have discussed many times that there is upper respiratory tract infection that's with lower respiratory tract infection lower respiratory tract infection then there is atypical or walking atypical pneumonia which is the basic um symptom symptomatology of viral pneumonias and basic pathology of viral pneumonias then typical typical pneumonia which is usually bacterial but this vi virus we have been discussing is so different that it can actually be so aggressive that it moves from atypical to typical then 
when the typical becomes more severe, then acute respiratory distress syndrome occurs. When that progresses, that causes septic shock and then uh, death. And we have also seen that during this process of typical pneumonia and ARDS, there is endothelial damage. We have discussed these things in the past. I'm just kind of reviewing that with us. Endothelial damage occurs. There is hypercoagulability that happens. Coagulability. And that causes vascular damage. Then that causes cardiac damage that can cause renal damage and so on. Renal damage actually occurs in this case because of two reasons. One is that kidneys have ACE2 enzyme in it. So there can be virus attacking there if it reaches there. And secondly, when the uh, ARDS, when the septic shock occurs and the blood pressure reduces, that reduces the blood flow to kidney, which damages it. And the third one is that when the acute respiratory distress syn syndrome occurs, there is less oxygen available and all, all organs get damaged, including kidneys. So back here now. According to the authors of this protocol, there are three main pathologies to consider. One is the cytokine storm. So we have all discussed that, that cytokine storm is an important part. Immune system gets dysregulated. The immune system responds, responds overwhelmingly, and that causes lots of damage inside the lungs and the blood vessels, which in turn reduces when the lungs are damaged, there is oxygen that is less. When blood vessels are damaged, then there is perfusion that goes down. When the septic shock generally occurs, that causes the blood volume and blood flow to go down as well. And so all of that is the result of the septic shock, cytokine storm, but cytokine storm is one. Then the hypercoagulability is the other. And we have talked about this in the past many, many times that blood vessels get injured. When these get injured, that causes the uh, thrombi to develop, which then causes emboli to develop and that causes damage. And we have done the mechanism as well that this happens because of ACE1, ACE2 um, imbalance or angiotensin 2 versus angiotensin 1 to 7 imbalance. So this is why I was kind of amazed that we have discussed those things based on which this protocol is. So you would actually feel so at home with this protocol because it seems like we had been discussing these things in the past. And then, of course, a third component of the pathology is the severe hypoxemia or less, ox um, uh, less oxygen in the blood. So let's continue. I'm going to show you that study, that document as well. Now I call everything a study. The core concept, the concept on which they are hanging their hat on is the following. They are saying that there is more damage and loss of lives in hospitalized patients because intensivists are reluctant. I'm using their word. I'm very, very careful about this, that I do not um, accuse anyone of uh, folks who are serving. So I'm using their word. They're saying that intensivists are reluctant to use anti-inflammatories or anticoagulants. And they are saying that because there is a delay or not use of these drugs, that further causes damage to the patient's um, lungs and patient's um, other organs. Then they further theorize, postulate. They say that the reason that the intensivists do not use this is because we try to treat this as a normal standard pneumonia, while they, they say that this is not a normal standard pneumonia. So for that, and I'm going to show you all of these things, for that they are saying that, hey, look, a normal acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is the next stage after the pneumonia, is different from COVID-associated acute respiratory distress syndrome. So they're saying that these are two different kinds of a thing. So I'm going to explain that today, that why are they saying that? And then 
the CARDS, the COVID-associated respiratory distress syndrome, is further divided into L-type and H-type. And we would explain that as well, that what does that mean? Once we are ready with those foundations, we will then be able to go back tomorrow into the discussion for hospitalized patients and ICU patients and discuss what to do about them. So with this, let's just look at the study, uh, the document a little bit. I keep calling it study. So first, they have this from Dr. A.B. of New York, who we have zero success for patients who were intubated. Our thinking is changing to postpone intubation to as long as possible. This is a very important thing. Yes, so there is a question that is the L-type, the loser type. Yes, and I'm going to show that as well. Um, Debbie says, thoughts on diaphragm paralysis, which is brought down on by, of course, if there is di diaphragm paralysis, that would cause even further aggravation of the um, respiration. So back here, we have zero success for patients who were intubated. Our thinking is changing to postpone intubation to as long as possible to prevent mechanical injury from the ventilator. And I'll try to uh, build that concept as well, that why does that happen? These patients tolerate arterial hypoxia surprisingly well. So I would like us to take away this one piece today. These patients tolerate arterial hypoxia surprisingly well. So we're going to look at this at what does this mean? And natural course seems to be the best. With this, they have a, the way they have structured their protocol, what they said was that, look, there is a person who gets um, exposed. So let's say that is here. And then they are, they are in the incubation time. We all know that that can be anywhere from two days to 14 days. And the mean is 5.1 days. Then they become symptomatic when the viral replication increases. And then our immune system starts fighting with it. Slowly, the viral replication would reduce. Immune system, this orange triangle, would become stronger and stronger. And then the patient would go from symptomatic to early pulmonary phase and late pulmonary phase. And then for various phases, they have that what will happen, the ground glass infiltrate would appear, clinical symptoms of various kind, what are the treatment approaches, and what are the potential therapies. With this, before I go for the prophylaxis and symptomatic treatments, these are the two pieces I want to discuss today. And then the mild symptoms on the floor and the essential uh, treatments in the ICU, we'll discuss them tomorrow. I want to come down here for a second and look at their basic concepts. What are they discussing? So here are these things that I had just shown you. So if you see here, the rationale for the math plus protocol, and I would say math plus plus because I would propose some changes in this as well, which I think that all of us, when we would look at it, will say, yeah, this needs to be there because we have discussed them in the past. So their protocol, hyperinflammation, cytokine storm. So we discussed that. We showed that here. So this is the diagram for their concepts here. Cytokine storm, dysregulated. Look, they're not saying over active immune system or under active immune system. They're saying dysregulated. And we have seen many times vitamin D would help with the regulation of it. Vitamin C would help with the regulation of it. N-acetylcysteine would help with that. CoQ10 will have help with that. ILC, IL-6 blockers can help. CCR5 disruptors can help. Remember all of those discussions? So that come in here, cytokine storm. Hypercoagulability increases, and we have discussed that as well with, because of the uh, imbalance between ACE2 and ACE1 to 7, severe hypoxemia. The, here is the interesting thing, the widespread and inappropriate reluctance amongst intensivists to employ anti-inflammatory and anticoagulant treatments, including corticosteroids. So that is a important change from our discussions in the past. We have been looking at the studies that say that if you use corticosteroids, that reduces the viral clearance, and that is why it is harmful. And they mention that in here, and they say, look, many organizations, including WHO and CDC, 
made a mistake of saying don't use steroids and they they are proposing to use steroid and the reason for that is the following for them they are saying that when the patient is in this advanced stage of being in icu and ventilator at that time it's not just the virus it is the immune system damaging our body and at that time more than the virus we need to make sure that the immune system is calmed down or it is reduced in its intensity so um, there is a question here from kyler that do you think the high flow oxygen is better absolutely so that is what the study is moving towards as well this document is moving towards as well and i agree with them so bond references sounds good uh, high glutathione so see lorat high glutathione is needed asap to cleanse immune system see this is what i am proud of that the cool beans here we here have been looking at the glutathione and nsl cysteines and coq tens and we have looked at the uh, various drugs that we can actually say that hey we should use this over here so i'm i'm very happy that that thinking has developed so if i go back here i'll i'll respond to some comments in a second uh, if i go back here so there is a question from sorry let me just look at some questions these are important so there is one here from n can the mistake about steroid also apply to nsaids possible and then um, guy says when someone has fever is that the result of the cytokine storm wouldn't that say that the cytokine so guy uh, fever is a simple outcome of interleukin 1 and interleukin 1 is released in many uh, all immune systems when they are active against infections so fever is a natural and normal phenomena that is not indicator of the cytokine storm cytokine storms indications are more the lung damage that we would see and the epithelial damage and the congestion and the edema and the septic shock and acute respiratory distress syndromes these are the indicators of the cytokine storm and proning so very good so nebu says hfnc high flow nasal uh, cannula plus pro so remember we have talked about proning many times as well so thoughts on biological medications such as humira and and we'll talk about that as well so i'm going to go back uh, kent says dysregulated due to dysregulated a uh, mass cells which may be regular which may lead to cytokine storm absolutely so i'm going to go back to the study for a second but see i am really really proud that we have gone through this thing so so see here now look at this it is essential to recognize that it is not the virus that is killing the patient so this is their basic concept virus is not the killing the patient it's the immune system so calm down the immune system stop just focusing on the virus then they say here in this one the systematic failure of critical care system to adopt corticosteroid therapy resulted from published recommendations against corticosteroid and i remember that even i have gone over those recommendations and even the study that showed that corticosteroids are incorrect to use so here in these authors point of view that is an incorrect approach and they're saying that who was wrong in it center for disease control was wrong american thoracic society infectious disease control association of america uh, they were all incorrect so they said a very recent publication by the society of critical care medicine and authored one of the members of the frontline covid-19 critical care group identified the errors made by these organizations in their analysis of corticosteroid studies based on the findings of SARS-1 and H1N1 so they're saying that these studies were in the previous and that is correct these studies are not on SARS-CoV-2 they were on the previous pandemics and that is why they feel that there is an error there so then they say our treatment protocol targeting these key pathologies has achieved near uniform success and i like one more thing that they're saying it is important to recognize that the covid-19 pneumonia does not cause ards it is the inflammatory system then here patient in whom the cytokine storm is not dampened will progress into the h type so today we'll talk about the l type and h type as well of the uh, people who are getting uh, ventilation 
So at the end of this uh, discussion, they have simply said once more that we do not have the magic bullet. But one thing I really liked about the, their uh, message was that they said, look, these diseases, cytokine storm, hypoxemia, and hypercoagulability, these are not new diseases. We have fought with them in the past. We know how to manage them separately. So why not deploy the same processes to, to manage them together? So I like their uh, point of view there. So now let's go and look at how they, they are offering to treat prophylaxis and the um, mild cases at home. And here, I think we would have a lots of fun because there are lots of things that you would comment on as well. So look, prophylaxis. Look at the drugs they have. Vitamin C, let's see if I can make it a little bigger. Vitamin C, 500 milligram twice a day. We have talked about it. Quercetin, 250 to 500 milligram. And if I ask you, that with quercetin, what else should be there? I think you would complete this prescription right now. Zinc should be there. So zinc is in the next line. Zinc 75 to 100 milligram per day. And then I am going to jump down a few lines to say chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. So this is why I call this as a plus plus protocol. We added our own cool bean plus to, to this. They are saying optional or uncertain for chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. I would remove chloroquine from this for sure. It's It has no value or it is rather destructive. I would leave hydroxychloroquine in there with zinc and quercetin. They, Jim, absolutely correct. They missed vitamin K. They missed NAC. They missed CoQ10. So this is why it is a math plus plus protocol that we are discussing here, which includes some of our own research as well for how to handle this. So back here to the top, vitamin C, 500 MGBD, good. Quercetin, 250 to 500 MGBD, fine. Quercetin must be accompanied with zinc and hydroxychloroquine. Otherwise, quercetin by itself is of no use. It's an ionophore. If you don't give zinc, then what are you going to really do with quercetin? Melatonin. So melatonin is one that we have not discussed. So I would like if tomorrow or then when we come back next week, we discuss the mechanism of action of melatonin and how that can help. <laughs> so James Kelly is saying the same thing that I'm talking about, that why is the mel melatonin added? And I would like to discuss that the mechanism next week to show how melatonin, melatonin participates in here. Then vitamin D3, 1,000 to 4,000 international units. So vitamin, you know that I'm a big fan of vitamin. I have done so many talks about vitamin so many times. And so here is vitamin D. Very good. Optional, famotidine or famotidine. Famotidine is actually a peptic ulcer drug. However, it was observed that people who were using famotidine and got COVID-19, their death rate was 14% of whatever study was compared to people who were on, on omiprazole where the death rate was 27%. So there is something that famotidine does that is useful. So here they have added that as optional. I would actually add that as something to be given. And then hydroxychloroquine, they have put that as an optional. I would add that here as something to be given. So now let me ask you, what else should be here? What else should be here? Remember vitamin K? We have not discussed the mechanism, but vitamin K should be here. Uh, we should have... Uh, NAC, NSTL cysteine over here because it is a very potent antioxidant plus it helps make glutathione. We have that done that discussion before. Coenzyme Q should be there. And we have done that discussion in the past that coenzyme Q, especially in the COPD and asthma patients, is reduced. Number one. Number two, whenever there is infection of the lung system, there is coenzyme Q that is reduced. 
So CoQ10 is very important to reduce the severity of the disease and inflammation by acting as a potent antioxidant. Right, so CoQ10. So prophylaxis, if I change that, I would take hydroxychloroquine out of optional. I would also add ivermectin here one dose. I would, although it is a prophylaxis, so I would say ivermectin one dose maybe every three days for whatever time of prophylaxis is needed. Then uh, I would add NSE and I would add CoQ10 with vitamin K and calcium here. Does that make sense? So vitamin D is being given, so we should give some calcium as well. So good, are we good with the prophylactic study and we know that what should be the treatment? Good, so now at this stage, so I see uh, Santoshini saying remdesivir without corticobone function. That's a different discussion. We'll discuss that at a later time. So James Kelly says that would you both, would you administer both the quercetin and CoQ10? Are their mechanisms similar? So quercetin is acting on as a zinc ionophore. That is why we need it, which hydroxychloroquine does too. So it is fine. And then CoQ10 is working as an antioxidant as well. So Claudia says that some, some say that ascorbic acid is not a good source of vitamin C. I think it is fine that it is uh, going to give the vitamin C that is needed. If not, then another form of vitamin C, whatever you feel comfortable with, that is okay. Iodine, I am not sure yet. So we'll talk about iodine and melatonin next week. Let, let me continue. But I wanted to kind of have us appreciate our own knowledge base at this time that we are at a stage to be able to comment and improve. So here, symptomatic patients that are at home, look at their treatment. And once again, imagine if you are prescribing it. Vitamin C, good. Quercetin, BD, good. And I would bundle them up again, once again, to say with zinc and with hydroxychloroquine. Again, they have put that in optional. I would not put it in optional. I would add ivermectin to that as well, which once again, they have put that in as optional. And I'm not criticizing them. They have done a wonderful job of putting this together. They at least show a way to approach this disease. I am just adding that there are certain things with, in the light of current data and studies that don't need to be optional anymore. So going back here, vitamin C, quercetin, zinc, fine. Melatonin, we'll talk about it next week, fine. Vitamin D3, 2,000 to 4,000. I would suggest 5,000 international urine today. Aspirin, optional, but I think aspirin is good in mild cases. So I would probably not take it as optional. I would make it um, part of the prescription. Femetrodine, once again, it reduces the mortality and intensity, so continue. Hydroxychloroquine, I would take that out of optional as well. And they are saying 400 milligram BID day one, followed by 200 milligram BID for four days. So that is fine. I do not actually like the 400 milligram BD the day one, the loading dose of 800 milligram. But India offers 800 milligram, and they have also said that. So maybe I'm more cautious. I like to just have 400 milligram BD continuing for the five days. And here is an interesting thing. This is just a very uh, small observation, one patient observation. So it is not a study. But one of my patients who I had given hydroxychloroquine with zinc and uh, uh, what is that? Azithromax with a inhaler. He um, went on fine for five days when he started taking. He was symptomatic before he talked with me. He was having lots of issues with the respiratory system. I started him on these drugs. For five days, he continued and he became very well. Then he, uh, I asked him to stop. And when he stopped, within one day, 
he developed such severe upper respiratory tract. Um, thank God that these was uh, these were upper respiratory tract infections. So he became nasopharyngitis developed, and he became really ill with that. Luckily, he was fine, and the shortness of breath started coming and going intermittently. So I asked him to start again without the azithromycin, just the hydroxychloroquine. And within next four or five days, he had one more day that was tough, and then he started recovering again. Now he's totally fine. So it became scary for me when I stopped the hydroxy to see how fast the, the infection bounced. And when I started again, within one day of that, it was suppressed again. So I have personal experience with the hydroxychloroquine patients. So I would not put it optional. I would make it uh, part of the um, prescription, although I will not give chloroquine. Chloroquine is more, uh, it's, it's dangerous. Then coming down here, ivermectin, I will put that as the uh, drug that should be given. Ivermectin 150 to 200 microgram per kilogram single dose. I actually give two doses. And then in symptomatic patients, monitoring with home pulse oximeter is recommended. All of the patients who talk with me, I always ask them, so they are, they are in different countries. I always ask them to buy an oximeter and keep their oxygen checked. So here, they, they are also saying that people should have oximeter available. And then if the saturation goes below 94%, they should be prompted to go to hospital. I usually tell them at 93%, to start looking to see if they can go to the hospital. Plus with that, I say um, heart rate of greater than 110, breathing rate becoming or going towards 30. These are plus the oxygen saturation dropping. These are all their indications to go to a hospital. So we would, at least with the prescription, any comments on this one, the symptomatic pa patients at home, would you like to change anything here? I would change the same things as I did before. B complex, absolutely. So medical visual says, what is your view of Nijala Sativa? So I actually believe that it is very useful and valuable. I just have to read up on the mechanism. OK, so it looks like we are good with this much. Now I'm going to go to the last topic for today, and that is the understanding of the ventil ventilator damage, understanding of the L type and H type uh, patients. So if you're ready, we are already 40 minutes into it. But if you are comfortable, we can continue going. Here is the article. I'll put the uh, links out. This is in the Plum Pulm CCM, and the article is written by, uh, where are the authors? I think here are the authors. So Jan MLS Kennedy. What they have discussed is the following, and this is what I'm going to present here. So what they're saying is that, look, if this is a lung, and when the lung becomes infected. So remember that in the lung, we have alveoli. We have airways, and then we have alveoli. So I'm just simplifying that for our purpose here. And then we have connective tissue. With that, we also have blood vessels that are bringing the blood in the system here, and the blood is flowing. Lungs are bringing oxygen here, or gases here, into the alveoli. Then what happens is here, here, the oxygen moves into the blood, and carbon dioxide from the blood moves into the alveoli. So that is what is our respiration, correct? Now, the interstitial pneumonia, as we have talked in the past, is a pneumonia that occurs in the interstitium or the connective tissue of the lungs. Normally, viral pneumonias are interstitial, where the airway stays clear. And that is why patient does not feel any problem like uh, productive cough or sputum 
but they still have their interstitium not working correctly and they start becoming hypoxic and short on breath, which we see with the, um, with the SARS-CoV-2. This is why the uh, dry cough as well, because the airways do not have the sputum in it. Then what happens is there is more damage to the point that the alveoli start getting damaged. And we have done this pathology in the past lecture, so I don't want to waste too much of your time here. Important thing is to realize that there is damage in the alveoli. That damage, so we have to kind of look at this today. Pneumonia, pneumonia when it occurs, what happens is it goes from atypical for SARS-CoV-2, atypical, to typical and then what happens is in the typical pneumonia there is congestion of the alveoli there is because of the immune system responses there is vasodilatation there is more blood in here which causes exudates to be produced those exudates start collecting in the alveoli plus inside the alveoli the cells start breaking down and the alveoli start becoming filled with broken cell, with the exudates, and with the virus, and with the macrophages, and immune system cells, and broken neutrophils making pus and everything. So over here, this alveoli becomes filled with that trash. Now this trash alveo filled alveolus has two outcomes. And this is what is really important for today. The outcomes are that either it will become resolved. Resolved means that this trash will be picked up and removed and the alveolus restored and the normal function reappears. So everything heals. That is one possibility. So everything heals, everything becomes better and we are good. This is called resolution. On the other hand, it is possible that this becomes organized. And organized means that instead of this alveolus becoming resolved, this trash material that just stays there and becomes scarred and fibrosis develops there. And this material just is now there forever. So now this part of the lung is damaged forever. It is gone. So when it is gone, then we say that this has become organized. This is the basis of the ventilatory damage that when ventilators are working and they are causing positive pressure in the lungs and that positive pressure causes the alveoli to start becoming damaged because of the extra pressure on them, then it is possible that the damage would result in lots of fibrosis, which would then result in acute respiratory distress syndrome because the lungs would start shrinking because of the organization of pneumonia and the organization of fibrosis and scarring of the damage caused by the ventilators. So now let's look at the L type and H type. What they're saying is, and this is fascinating, what they're saying is that in the lungs, of a patient that is suffering with COVID-19, when the damage starts occurring, they say that in the beginning, the lungs do not, they do not shrink. They do not shrink. So that is called baby lung pathology. And what that means is that this kind of a lung that was undergoing a damage, this lung will start to shrink under that damage and the fibrosis and the result will be lung will become shrunken it will become heavy because there is a lots of material trapped in it and it will become less compliant compliant simply means elasticity of something less compliant means that it has become so thick now it has become it has gotten so much scars in it and fibrosis in it that it cannot <clears throat> it cannot inflate correctly it can it's not elastic now 
This is the normal behavior of severe pneumonia and ARDS. They are saying that in the patients of COVID-19, in the beginning, this is not observed. There is damage to the lungs, but that damage is not to the lung tissue itself. The, instead, the damage is to the vascular system, which then causes the exudates to occur, which causes the congestion in the lung, but the lung tissue, that means the airways and the alveoli are not damaged. This is very important for them in their discussion. Why this is important is, if the alveoli is not damaged, if the lung volume is not shrunken, if the lung elasticity is not gone, if the compliance is correct, that means, that means you actually don't need to ventilate the patient. Why do you not need to ventilate the patient? Because his alveoli are already open. How can you open more alveoli, which is called recruiting, if there are no alveoli collapsed? Ventilators are needed when the alveoli are collapsing and when we need to put positive pressure to keep them inflated like balloons. But here, in the beginning of the damage, there is no alveolar um, damage or collapse which needs the ventilator to push it open. This is what they call L-type L type state of pneumonia. And in this state, why did they call it L-type? Because everything is low. So let me show you here. If you come here, they say, CT evidence supports these findings. The early COVID-associated respiratory distress syndrome lung is seen to have low elastance. Please uh, see here. Seem to have low elastance, low lung weight. Low lung weight is a good thing because that means lung is inflated. It has air in it. It is not very weighty. It does not have a lot of fluid and scarring and the tissue debris to become heavy with. So low lung weight, low response to positive end expiratory pressure. So if you are going to now take this lung that is already inflated and you try to inflate it more, you're not going to get anything. Normally, when a lung has alveoli that are collapsed, so let's say these are collapsed alveoli because of some infection or pressure or cancer or whatever. <laughs> these are <laughs> funny alveoli I made. I, I'm trying to make collapsed alveoli. In these, and let's say then the, some alveoli are open and they are working fine. Now these collapsed alveoli, when you put positive pressure on them, they would start opening up as well. This is called lung recruitment. But this is only possible when the alveoli have collapsed. And here they're saying in the beginning, CT evidence shows that the lung alveoli have not collapsed. The patient situation is because the blood vessels are damaged, which cause congestion in the lung. In such patients, they are proposing that do not put them on ventilator use prone positioning, that means uh, their head down their, uh, on their chest, they're lying on their chest, head down, and then they're breathing. Use prone positioning to recruit more area of the physiological lung, and then give them nasal cannula, that means give them a mask with the oxygen in it, but do not put them on ventilator. Because putting them on ventilator, when the whole lung is inflated already and trying to inflate it further is going to cause the damage. Make sense? That is going to cause the damage. So the patient, so now that we were talking about it here, that the patient goes from typical pneumonia to then acute respiratory distress syndrome, they are saying that from typical pneumonia, this is not a regular pneumonia. They, they would actually go into an L-type pathology where lungs are actually fine. Patient is in distress. There is immunity, immune system that is working and causing damage. And they are saying lungs are fine. Don't put them on ventilator. Instead, take care of their immune system. If you don't take care of that, then the damage of the immune system and the virus plus the ventilator's damage 
will then cause so if you read this here if this paragraph if COVID associated ARDS progresses, so Luffy, it is his time to meow. The peripheral ground glass and interstitial edema, which type, typify the L type, can morph into a typical ARDS pattern with dependent consolidations and baby lung physiology, which is shrunken lung. Then the patient is observed to have high elasticity. So now, if we do not control the situation, here at the L type correctly. And their proposal is that the correct is not to put the patient on ventilator right away, not to rush to the ventilator, start using uh, steroids, start using anticoagulants and start reducing the immune system's damage. Then you don't have to end up in the H state. If the damage is not taken care of, then what would happen is that as I discussed before, fibrosis would start occurring. Wherever there is damage, that damage is replaced, as I said, either resolved or organized. If it is organized, that is going to cause scarring. When the scarring would occur, the lung would start becoming shrunken. This is the baby lung physiology or pathology. When the lungs are shrunken, now they are heavy with the debris and trash in them, plus the fluids in them. They are less elastic because they are now shrunken with, uh, with fibrosis, and now they are in trouble. So this is what they are talking about here, that then the patient is observed to have high elastance, that means stiff lung. And if they have developed stiff lung, now you have to ventilate them because the lungs would not inflate by themselves. High lung weight, why? Because of lots of debris and trash and fibrosis and the fluids. High response to PEEP, which is positive end expiratory pressure, and they are now responding to with the high PEEP and then coining the H type. When the patient reaches the H type, and I want to show you here a, a picture here. So if you see here, do you see these, these white septa all over the place? This is fibrosis in the lung. So this is a patient of COVID-19 who has gotten so much damage by the virus, by the immune system and by the ventilator that there is so much repair done, that there is so much scar produced that even if the patient can come off of ventilator, they cannot breathe easily because they are scarred. Their lungs are scarred. This is just like if somebody gets burnt and if you look at their skin, that has a big scar on it. And if it is on a joint or something, the joint gets contracted. It cannot function properly because the scar has contracted. That is a similar problem here. So this is the difference in L type and H type. What they're saying is, and I want to read it from their, uh, this is my last point and then we'll stop for today. I want to read it from here that they're saying, It is important to recognize that COVID-19 pneumonia does not cause ARDS. The initial phase of oxygenation failure is characterized by normal lung compliance. and so lung is normal with poor recruitability. We cannot recruit more alveoli because they're already inflated. What else are you going to inflate? And near normal lung water, which is fine. This is the L phenotype as reported by Gattonini and colleagues that we just discussed. Look at this. Treating these patients with early intubation and the ARDS net treatment protocol will cause the disease you're trying to prevent. So it would take them to ARDS if they were not ARDS. This is very, very important. This part here, I'm going to make it, let's say, red. Treating these patients at this stage can actually cause so much damage that they can then develop ARDS and then go downhill from there. These patients tolerate hypoxia, hypoxia remarkably well without an increase in blood lactate concentration fall in central and fall in central venous pressure. So here they are saying we suggest therefore to give high flow nasal cannula with frequent patient repositioning to proning and the acceptance of permissive hypoxemia. Permissive hypoxemia means that you are giving only enough oxygen 
that there is the there is still hypoxemia but that is the amount of oxygen is still sufficient to continue to allow the body to function so they're saying accept that don't fight with it and say okay there is hypoxemia and we're going to put the patient on ventilator so this is where we are here and kylie kyler is saying can you fix a stiff lung well if it has become stiff because of scarring then no or it would take a long time to fix it uh, to make it a little bit more elastic or maybe recruit other parts of the lungs to function but if it is sti stiff because there is um, there is debris in there and there is uh, you know temporary trash present and there is fluid viscosity is created all those can be taken care of but if it is damaged lung fixed with fibrosing then no So Atush, uh, how much hypoxia is permitted? It would depend upon the patient situation. So patients, and they talk about it as well at the end of their uh, uh, protocol, they say that although this is the protocol, we still believe that every patient, their age, their sex, their comorbidities, their body type, their obesity, and all of those things would determine how do you manage one by one. So this is the discussion. We will continue this discussion tomorrow for the in-hospital and on-ventilator treatment or management. If you like, you can give them a look as well. It is a fascinating study, very interesting, and I'm happy that we've talked most of the mechanisms. We will, there are some drugs, for example, steroids that need to be discussed. Melatonin needs to be discussed. Fematidine needs to be discussed. So we will continue to discuss them in the coming days. So our topic is done. I'm sorry it is one hour. People make so many complaints that hey, it is very long and intimidating. But I think it is important for us to understand the mechanisms. So what do you think of nebulized glutathione? Sure, I'm fine with that. Um, so there is, Kent says at some point, maybe the investigation in the virus itself as a virus Variopurines and the ion channels. Absolutely. So I have received this comment many times that we have not done the viral replication as a unit of discussion, and we have not done the pathology as a unit of discussion. We have discussed these species in different parts of our lectures. So if you like, we can do that. So with this, let us uh, stop for today. Four to six milliliter ideal body weight for stiff lungs like typical ARDS. Um, Kyler says, thanks, Professor. <laughs> You're very welcome. Uh, dear sir, what are you thinking about? have done so much for all. Thinking now that you've done so much. Margaret, I am very happy to continue to do this. I was actually, so thank you for bringing it up. I was actually thinking of using these lectures, 60, 70 lectures now, and write a book. The only thing is I do not have enough time to write it. So I was thinking maybe we should do a Patreon, or we should do a GoFundMe type of a thing, and maybe we can hire a couple of people, one a typing person and one an artist, and give them these lectures to say, put them down in the form of a writing and use the diagrams that we have been making to create an asset for the community in general. So if somebody is uh, interested in working with me to, uh, to create a book, uh, that would be excellent. James, thank you very much. Stay safe, stay happy, and talk to you guys tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll discuss um, the ICU and hospital management. We'll discuss some more mechanisms for the lung, and then we'll go from there. Thank you very much. Stay safe, stay healthy, and talk to you tomorrow. Like, subscribe, and share.